afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Lindstrom, Chair of the Environment Committee, and I will call the Environment Committee to order for October 25th. We've got a great agenda this afternoon, and is there a motion uh, to approve the consent, uh, excuse me, to approve the agenda for today? So moved. And a second? Need to vote on the agenda. You know, we seem to go back and forth on this. Like <laughs> yesterday's transportation committee, uh, they did uh, uh, reviewed it th this afternoon, and and uh, they uh, changed the rules on us again. I think they changed the rules. I, yeah, it's, seriously, I, I'd like some clarification on that. Okay. Um, well, then we'll but vote. We, we can we can vote on it, and if we don't need it, then yeah, so be it. Um, and we've got a motion, and if, did we did I, we did we get a second? I'll on second that it. All if right. it hasn't been seconded. All righty. Uh, and all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. And that takes us to the minutes of September 27th, 2022. Move Any changes? Minutes, minutes as presented. Second. And motion's been made and seconded. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. Just one item on our consent agenda, and that is the City of Mendota 2040 Comprehensive Plan Update review. Is there a motion to approve today's consent agenda? Move the consent agenda. And a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor say aye. Uh -huh. Aye. Opposed nay? Carries. Two items on our non-consent agenda. First one is the same week item, Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant Services Building Site Improvements. Tim, welcome. Okay, can you hear me? Good. You're coming in loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members, and thank you for the opportunity to present this business item. Uh, my name is Tim Amstutz, and I am an assistant manager in plant engineering, one of the programs in wastewater planning and capital project delivery. I'll be presenting business item 2022-266, called the Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant Services Building and Site Improvements Project, contract 21P015. The Services Building and Site Improvements Project is in the northwestern corner of the Metro plant. The map on the left of your screen shows the general location of the project within the plant. The image on the right shows a planned view of what the Metro um, Services Building uh, may look like from a conceptual perspective. The service building consists of three parts and is shown in different shades of blue um, with the designated letters A, B, and C. The site improvement part of the project um, are designated with the letters D and E. They're smaller um, on that map. I'll provide more information about the services building and the site improvements in the next several slides. As I mentioned on the previous slide, the services building consists of um, areas shown in the slide as areas A, B, and C. Um, area A will be a new addition to the west of the existing laboratory building, which is on B, site A, B there and will be a 27,580 square foot new office space for water resources, industrial waste and pollution prevention, and construction services staff, plus shared amenities for all building occupants located throughout the facilities. Water resources is currently housed in the existing laboratory building. Industrial waste and pollution prevention is currently located at Metro 94, and the construction services staff is currently in temporary trailers um, in the plant. Area B uh, will uh, remodel approximately 18,828 square feet in the analytical laboratory to include upgraded office space for existing laboratory staff and research and development R&D staff. Upgraded facilities for existing laboratory functions and dedicated laboratory facilities for both laboratory and R&D staff. Okay. 
Area C will be a new structure to the east of the existing building um, called, called the Field Services Annex, FSA. The structure will provide approximately 17,950 square feet of mixed use space for field sample collection and processing, storage for field equipment, and indoor parking for 10 vehicles. Area D, called the East Primary West Tunnel Extension, is shown in green on the map. Um, it will be an addition to the existing Metro Tunnel Network. The tunnel will provide employees with enclosed access to the rest of the plant and will also provide emergency shelter during severe weather. This slide shows site improvement work both inside and outside of our perimeter fence. Uh, area E shown on the map is a new north guard station which will include a single story facility of approximately 840 square feet providing for controlled pedestrian access for staff and visitors. The guard station will be staffed during regular working hours with a video and audio link to the main West Guard Station for monitoring when guard staff are not present. There will be no vehicular access at this entrance. Other site improvements include the following. North access road upgrades to accommodate increased traffic and improve facility safety. Expanded employee and visitor parking outside the um, security perimeter fence. Expanded parking at the services building for MCS staff parking. Safe and efficient vehicle circulation for internal and external to the um, security perimeter fence. A turnaround um, of, uh, next to the FSA building to the east uh, for temporary boat trailer parking and then landscaping. On May 24th of this year, I presented business item 2022-149 called authorization to hold a public hearing for Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant Services Building and Site Improvements. Both the Environment Committee and the Council approved the business item. A virtual information meeting was held on August 30th, 2022 and the virtual public hearing on September 19th, 2022. I would like to thank Chair Lindstrom for helping us during the public hearing. Thank you for your introductory comments, calling the public meeting to order and the public and at the public hearing conclusion, opening the hearing to comments, so thank you. The purpose of the public hearing was to, one, be a good neighbor and inform stakeholders about the upcoming construction project. Two, to provide an opportunity for stakeholders to share their questions and comments about the project and third, to meet the design-build delivery approach process requirements within Minnesota Statute 471A. The solicitation for this project was completed in two steps. In step one, a request for qualifications, RFQ, shortlisted three design-build firms. Uh, they were Adolson and Peterson Construction, Knudsen Construction Services, and Krauss Anderson Construction. In step two, a request for proposals RFP was issued April 5th, uh, 2022 to the shortlisted firms. The Metropolitan Council underutilized business MCUB goal for the project is 12%. Procurement solicited, facilitated a pu uh, public plea proposal meeting on April 26, 2022 that outlined the solicitation requirements, discussed project specifications, and responded to plan holder inquiries. There were 50 registered plan holders and 13 of the plan holders identified as minority women, small, veteran, or disadvantaged business enterprises. The council received one proposal on August 18th, 2022 from Adolson and Peterson Construction. <clears throat> the, 
The proposal was evaluated by a valuation panel comprised of MCS staff members and an external stakeholder. The evaluation process included an independent reading and evaluation of the proposal by each panel member, followed by a meeting of the group to discuss findings. The criteria used to evaluate the proposal were the quality of the proposal, the design approach, the project delivery plan, and price. The evaluation panel reached consensus that the proposal submitted, submitted by Ed Elvis and Peterson Construction is advantageous to the council. The proposed action asked for today is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute contract 21P015 with Adelson and Peterson Construction to design and build the Metropolitan Wastewater Treatment Plant Services Building and Site Improvements Project in an amount not to exceed $47,126,000. And this concludes my presentation, Mr. Chair and committee members, and I am happy to entertain any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Amstutz or Mr. Jacoby? It's a big project. Uh, we've been talking about this for a long time, and we're excited that it's gotten to this, this phase. Thank you. Well, we are too. I have one question, Council Member. Well, I do have a comment. It never, it never feels good to have three qualifieds and then end up with one proposal. It never feels mm -hmm. for $47 million. Mm -hmm. it, uh, we generally want to see some head-to-head -head competition for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but in this scenario, and there's, there's just not many that can do that. And I can also see why, um, you know, there, we, did, we did get a good proposal. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because of that, I'm going to vote for this. Thank you. Uh, any thoughts on that or any uh, thoughts on why we didn't get three or why we only got one? Chair Lidstrom, Committee Madam Rosaron. My name is Jody Jacoby, and I'm the, the I was going to say I'm the chair. I'm not the chair. <laughs> I'm the director You're of the You're welcome to be the department. chair at any time. Um, <laughs> just here to explain a little bit more about this project and design build, um, this uh, environmental services We'll have a total of three in a few years, and it's a interesting and it's an innovative contracting approach to allow for that value engineering. And with this specific project, we did shortlist six proposals, which, three. wait, we received six proposals. Thank you, Tim. Um, and they were reviewed on the criteria of project organizational leadership, the key personnel experience, project understanding, delivery and capacity approach and safety. So three were shortlisted and we had a competitive range. It was very clear with those top three who were invited then to respond to the uh, follow-up proposal. And um, one of the firms didn't submit because they had some changes with staffing. We're all really aware mm -hmm. due to the labor shortage and the great resignation. And frankly, they indicated with some challenges with market conditions that they made a decision to not proceed in the process. And then the other firm failed to submit the proposal by the deadline. So it, we did receive a quality proposal that we believe met our needs. And we, uh, when we were sending out for the shortlist, we expected to receive three back, but that's not the way that this process played out. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. I just was wondering, like, what is the timetable for getting the bid back? Uh, so, like, and, and, and would it be, like, if we had a, more of a time, would it be possible we'd get more bids, like, just to get the, the qualified bid back to you? I, I don't, don't think I understand. Okay, this well, is okay, so one is one is... to get back with a bid, but I'm kind of wondering what's the, like how much time do they have to get a qualified bid back? 
-hmm. You know, like I just uh, know, for example, my mom used to do audits of these construction companies mm -hmm. back in the day, and there'd be quite a bit, but if you had two mm -hmm. weeks to do an audit, there's no way you're going to get that audit done. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of one of these bids, and it's a huge project, $47 million. Mm -hmm. Are we saying, oh, you need a project, you know, back in two weeks, and one company's working 160 hours, three shifts to get this one in, and the other one just doesn't have the resources to do that. So I'm wondering, are we giving them enough time, and how much time do we give them? For, you know, yeah, good, this great question. Um, Mr. Chair and council members, uh, we, um, I, I, I don't have the exact dates here, but I know we gave them, we started with at least, um, I think it was 60 to 90 days first, okay? We gave them that to start with. I may not be precise in the numbers. Mm -hmm. And then they um, asked for an extension. So we um, continually during the procurement process, we're listening and responding to requests from the three proposals. And if they requested an extension and they provided a reasonable um, rationale for it, we provided that extension. So um, as I don't have the exact time, but um, we, and actually in the very end, um, one of them responded to us and was very thankful that we gave them a lot of time to respond because this is a very complicated project and we wanted to make sure that we, um, um, help them out as much as we possibly could. Okay. Well, so I think we were bent over backwards to help them out. Okay. Appreciate it. Thanks. Other questions? Do we have a motion? I move approval. Second. Zero seconds. Thanks. I'll let you battle it out on who got the second in there. But uh, <laughs> uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Carries. Thank you. Thank you very much. That takes us to our second non consent agenda item, which is 2022 278 Metro Water Conservation Utilizing MinTap Interns. Mr. Clark and now Mr. Al Hassan, welcome. Hi. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Ali Al Hassan. I'm the manager of water supply planning for the next couple of days. And uh, um, I would like to introduce the manager of the program, uh, for, for the manager of this program, the MINTA program in the water supply planning, uh, Dr. John Clark. Uh, John has joined us in 2016. Uh, and before that, he has been in the field for about nine years. So a total of 15 years in the water planning and uh, John is, uh, is the principal environmental scientist with the water supply planning, and who will be managing the MINTAB program from the Met Council side. As you might know, the MINTAB is run totally by the University of Minnesota for us. We, con we have a contract with University of Minnesota since 2012 uh, to run this program for us. So um, why we wanted to target the industrial and waste and the commercial water use in the metro area, it's uh, the second biggest water users in the uh, metro area after the urban and the residential water use is the industrial water use. And most of the time, it's very easy to work with them because it's a target that's easy identified and we can work with them very easily. Um, approximately 125 million gallons per day uh, in the metro area is used for industrial and commercial water use. And a lot of that is coming directly from groundwater. They have their own permits to pump groundwater. Um, and many of them, you know, um, they prefer to pump groundwater directly because city water is going to be a little bit expensive for them to, uh, to utilize. So they prefer to go to the DNR, apply for D groundwater, uh, permits and in many cases they're they're putting a lot of stress on the cities in, in a way that their wells are really big wells they are taking a lot of water and in many cases the uh, the the program is providing them with cost saving in a way of reducing their water use looking into their uh, wastewater 
uh, reduction that's coming into our systems in, uh, at, at the end, and also reducing their heating, their waste, and all of that. So MinTab is looking into different areas. And in 2012, we started working with them in specifically targeting uh, water efficiency for industries. And also with that come the reduction in energy use and other things. So in addition to the water efficiency, there is other benefits that they started seeing also in the program. Uh, but also some of the companies as part of their vision for the future, they started to uh, market themselves as a marketing strategy as environmentally uh, uh, awareness, their environmental awareness and also their stewardship for the, for the resources and that's why they wanted to be part of this program. And so when we started this program, we had only two companies applying for it. Uh, last year, 2021, which is the first year that we, uh, or this year, actually 2022, when we back fully after the pandemic, this is the first year that we are fully back after the pandemic. It's, we have so many applications that we have to, the university needed to go through a lot of those applications because we didn't have a lot of funding available. We have only funding for five interns and we, uh, we were able to send only five out of, uh, I think we received about nine applications. So four of them, we told them that we try to put them, uh, the university told them that they're gonna put them for the short list for next year, uh, if this program continues for next year. And so businesses are really interested in this program because they started hearing about this and, and every year the university publish a publication after of all the interns and what they did um, and they send it a copy of us. If you are interested, I'm very happy to share it with all of you. So at, at the end of each one of the programs, they share uh, a very short publication telling about each intern, what they did and where they did it, uh, which kind of business. Uh, and, and, and this program is not only for wa water, it goes also for wastewater areas, it goes also for energy. So we are a small part of the program. And so, those businesses are really interested in saving money and water. And that they are really busy. They don't have a dedicated staff to go and do these things for them. So our job was to kind of help the university create kind of a consultancy for them to do these, identify some of the, um, I would say, um, really easy things that they can do, they can change so that they can uh, reduce their water use or uh, reduce their uh, heat or, or energy use in the region. <clears throat> so our partnership with the university and with the uh, with the uh, um, with the businesses uh, started in 2012. Since 2012, we have been funding the uh, college summer interns. I think the cost over the years of the intern increased as inflation, as all of us we know. But when we started this program, the cost was $9,000 per intern. And now I think it's about 13,000 or 14,000. Um, the university is paying the same amount of per hour that our internship here in the council are paying. So they wanted to match that and they are gonna, they, they have been doing that. Um, the, the, um, one of the things that I just wanted to make sure that people understand about this program, the businesses also, they have a cost share in this. So they pay, uh, we pay part of the money for the intern and the university to run the program for us and all of that, but also they pay part of the salary of the intern in addition to the accommodation of the intern. You know, they provide them with an office, they provide them with with all the things that they needed to stay with them for about three to four months in their offices. And so the, there is a cost share that the businesses are also paying uh, for this program. So through 2021, we have funded 40 summer interns. We saved over 240 million gallons per year. This is a cumulative amount of water saved up to 2021. So each year we add, when we add the, because you and you save that gallon that stays for the 10 years. So we help them save the water and the cumulative up to 2021 is about 240 million gallons per year. And we, the business is saved about $1.7 million per year. So this is a significant uh, reduction in, in, in the cost of, of running the business for them. And that's why they're really interested in this program and there is a big return 
on investment for this program. Uh, but one of the other things that we wanted to bring to your attention, this program has been, um, um, as some of the students said, a life changer for them. And you can see in front of you, this is one of the uh, quotes from one of the interns that they learn th skills and things that they don't teach them in classroom. And, and this, is, is, this is a very important thing for, uh, for creating some some sort of a pipeline of some of these students that will join us in the Met Council someday or any other organizations in the state of Minnesota and help the, the state building some of these uh, 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 skills uh, in them before they hit the ground uh, you know, in, in, in working in some of these uh, businesses or in state agencies. And so we were really proud that we provided this uh, uh, opportunity for students the application rates for, from students from around the country, not only from Minnesota, has increased significantly over the past years. I remember two years ago, I have students, I have met students in this program who came all the way from, uh, from Virginia to attend the program, and some students from Iowa, students from Wisconsin. And so it's, it's not only students from Minnesota who are doing this, and not only the UFM, but other students from other parts of uh, other universities in Minnesota, they're applying for this. I remember last year they received about uh, 60 applications, and they selected only five students. So it's a, a very fierce competition, and uh, we were hoping to provide more money for this program, uh, but I think also we are, we are looking at the the capacity of the MINTAP people, and they don't have more than five students to manage five students, so that's why we stick with the five students over the past couple of years. So, what's our money is paying for? Uh, we uh, provide the funding for the university who run the program. We provide guidelines from our side, what we want to see from, from the Met Council perspective and share with them what's the regional direction, what's the regional strategy and policies, and they built the program around that. And actually, that shifted over years. The, the, the importance of the supervisory job of the Met Council staff have shifted, you know, the, the, the kind of the policy direction have shifted over years. As an example, when we started this program, we were targeting businesses that only use groundwater, and they have their own permits. But over the years, we heard back from the cities, actually, because now cities are more interested in this program. They said, you know, we want you to help us with some of our big users who are industrial users. So can, can we be part of that instead of only the, the, com the, the companies or the businesses that have their own groundwater permits? Can we shift to companies that use city water and we can help us to reduce some of that? And, that's the shift we made when in this program. So this program is not a stagnant that from the start we have to target this, but we shift as we hear back from the communities. And this is a real partnership with the communities. When we recruit now com companies, we go through the cities. We ask the cities, who do you suggest? And the cities they send uh, for, they, they actually help us and help the university advertise for the program among their biggest water users, whether that's commercial users or industrial users. And most recently, I know that there is some cities have been using this to target bigger, uh, big apartment complexes into identifying some of the opportunities for uh, reduction of water use. And so the university helped develop and scope the projects. They select the companies and the projects all done by the university. Uh, we are partners with them. We know about all of these steps. They keep us updated. They have updates every month to the project, uh, the program manager here internally. And then they finalize the agreements and the higher train and the, the students. They, they do that all internally, separate from us. And they coordinate the student uh, presentation and they coordinate uh, their work with the, with the company and all of that. So in a way, we are paying for this, but we are getting a lot of benefit from this program uh, because it's run by university and using the students. And 
it's a very successful program. Uh, I can tell you that the amount of money we are spending and the number of projects that, uh, or the number of things that the students have recommended to the companies and the companies implemented have significantly changed uh, the, the, amount, the amount of water they use and the way that they run their businesses. And sometimes, uh, it, it's, uh, and I would encourage you to attend some of these presentations by the students, they will go and find just a small valve. Changing a small valve in a place will reduce water significantly that the business have not paying attention for it for many, many years because that's the way they have been running the business. And so those things were not very expensive for the business to change. And that's why they have been very encouraging and encouraged by the, uh, the, the way that the students present all of these ideas to them and they have been uh, implementing them. So one of the things why we are interested in this, why we wanted to continue this program for the next three years, the success of this program over the last 10 years was one of the reasons for continuing getting fund from Clean Water Fund. Every time I go, I present about this program to the Clean Water Fund or the Clean Water Council, they loved this program and they loved the, the success of this program. This is one of the implementation programs that they have seen that there is real return on investment. And although we are investing a small amount of money here, they see that there is a significant return on investment here and it's, it's a good sign for them. And that's why we continue to get funding from the Clean Water Fund uh, for supporting this program in the, uh, in the, over the years. Another thing that we have a benefit of this program, this is a real partnership between businesses in the region, communities who have been helping us in recruiting some of these businesses and commercial uh, uh, facilities in them, and the University of Minnesota as well as the Met Council. With that, Mr. Chair, um, the proposed action here is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the regional administrator to negotiate and execute amendment number five to contract 14I007 with the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program, MINTAB, at the University of Minnesota to extend contract until December 31st, 2025 and to increase the contract in an amount not to exceed 315,500 uh, $315, for a total contract amount not to exceed 1,62,500. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I have a quick question. Is this entirely funded by the Clean Water Fund? Yes, Mr. Chair. Fantastic. Great. I can see why they love it. Council Member Wolf and then Bento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a great program, and I'm glad that we're going to be able to continue to do that work. It's one of those good news things. People, There's so much bad news about the Met Council. It seems like when you can give the good news things, it, 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 it's a nice change. Um, I did have one request that you guys fix the report on page two under rationale. It says over, let's see, this amendment is needed to continue XXX. So somebody forgot to. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. We'll For, forgot that. one little section on sure. the, the report. So if you get that fixed before the Definitely. full council meeting, that would be wonderful. Mr. Chair, thank you very much. We'll do that. Councilmember Bento. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd be interested in knowing um, which cities and companies have participated since 2012. Um, it would just be good to know. I particularly am interested in my, who from my district, because I, I find this, I agree with, with um, both the chair and Councilmember Wolf that this is a great program. I, as a former teacher, any time that we're we reaching out to the future generation during the educational phase and Getting, getting students engaged in what they hope to have as their future work, I think it's a great thing, um, both for the organization but also for the community. I'm also interested in whether or not there's something similar to this through um, the MPCA or DNR that, that, um, and the U that works with um, companies on making sure that whatever um, waste they have is done in a safe and environmentally friendly way as possible, to, you know, ways to study that and to advance that. Having had a, a company in, in District 11 that mm. had some pretty serious issues, I think whatever we can do there to prepare the future generation of 
environmental workers in the waste treatment area is really important. Mr. Chair, council members, thank you very much for that question. And, and truly, MINTAP has a lot, they try to address a lot of the waste issues also. So MINTAP is not, the part that we fund is a very small part. Mm -hmm. They have at least, I think every year, uh, I'm, John, you can correct me, about 30 interns. Many of them are supported by MPCA for doing uh, the same thing for other parts, and, and it's a statewide program, so they will send people outside of the metro. We are sponsoring the water issues in the metro area, and so right. it's a small part. Uh, definitely there is um, a potential for MINTAP to, to do um, more work, and I think they get funding from the MPCA for a specific work in the side of the waste, and I definitely, I will, I will, uh, I will send you the contact for the MINTAP uh, uh, program uh, leader in, in the university so that you can talk to her, and she's very helpful in this. Follow up? I have one more question. Th uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm interested in, in, in the company's desire to use their participation in this program as part of their marketing, and I'm wondering if there are any standards that they have to meet in order to be able to do that. I mean, it's one thing to participate, but then it's another thing to achieve through the participation. And so, um, it, it, can they just use it whether they achieve the goals they had or not, or? Uh, Mr. Chair, council members, um, many of the companies, they in, in recent years, we started seeing this in recent years, that they have a strategy that they, they want it to be environmentally mm -hmm. uh, aware of what the resources they are using. Mm -hmm. And in many times, they use the results of these mm -hmm. reports from the university into advertising, saying that next year, last year, we saved this amount in energy, we saved this amount of water, and we saved, um, uh, and, and we did so and so with regard to environmental stewardship. So it, it's, it's many of the companies, they love to use some of this data and information as part of their marketing strategy. Okay. In, 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 uh, and, and actually, they are, they are helping us in inviting other companies to be part of this in, by saying that. And, and, and so it has been, I, I, have, I have met some of the businesses that they heard from their peers about how great this program is without the university reaching out to them. And that's why they applied the next year so that they can be part of it. And so that's in a way they are doing that job for the university and for us and helping us. Um, Mr. Chair, I, I think you asked a question about the communities since 2012. We have a map showing the communities who participated over the years. I will send that to you great. after this meeting. Great, thank you. And to all of you. Yeah, that'd be great if we're talking to a city council or a community group to say that we've partnered with 3M or uh, what, you know, whatever the industry might be in, in, our, in our district, that would be fantastic. Sure. Council member. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just had a couple of questions. Like, so how many companies have either been recommended for the service or have applied for the services? You know, the, maybe the total pool you know, since it started. So in 2022, which is this year, um, as of be, at the beginning of this program when they advertised, they received about nine uh, applications and they were only available, there were only five spots only available for them. So those four, they were not said, you know, not going to get anything, but they put in the short list for next year so that they can be candidates for next year. And so, um, and, and, and over the years, the number of companies goes up and down. The, during the pandemic, we didn't receive a lot of applications. Uh, we received, and because there was uh, some applications that uh, some companies were not allowing anyone to be in, the, in their facilities from outside, uh, very interestingly, last year we received an application from the state of Minnesota mm -hmm. to audit one of their buildings. Uh, <laughs> and, and we sent an intern there, and that was one of the good presentations of 2021, of 2021, yeah. And so it's now, it's now only not the businesses, it's, uh, it's more of uh, everyone who is seeing an issue in their water use or energy use, and they wanted to hire an intern, so they go to Mintab and say, can we put an application? And we know, I know that cities, specifically cities for their facilities, uh, I know that Woodbury 
Hugo, they have done this in the last couple of years that they wanted to audit their water use, the city water use. And so they sent, uh, the Mintap sent interns for them to do that work for them. Great. Uh, yeah, please, Just Councilman. a couple Mr. follow ups here. So, one of them would be is like, for example, let's say you're working with a brewery and there's like more or less 150 breweries in the state. <laughs> when they make the report, do, like in solutions, do they kind of maybe use that for like a cookie cutter? Like, this is what we did with this Minnesota TAP project and then send that out to maybe the other breweries. Or, for example, if you work with the city of Hugo and say, well, we water every third day, this is it, so then other cities can do it. So, like, the strength becomes in numbers by getting what that intern, you know, comes up with with the business or the city. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, council members, uh, last year we had an intern who went through the 10 years uh, worth of work that we did, and they compiled all of the best management practices that we learned from all of these for each one of the industries. That's a separate report than solutions, and that report is ready, uh, it's available at the university, the MinTab website because we felt the same idea that if, if we can go beyond, share the knowledge that we accumulated over the last 10 years, if people want to see, uh, yeah, we have been studying this, we have been doing this at the, this very small scale, but how about expanding this program so that it can help more people? And we found the only way to do that is document the 10 years uh, worth of work that we have done and we put that in MinTab report, and that's what is available for all the industries. And I think it's, it's a very interesting report. I would, I would encourage all of you to take a look at that. I will send it around uh, um, so that you can, uh, if you have interested businesses, they can look into it. Right, thank you. Uh, uh, Council Member Wolf. It's not related to this, but I have to ask, what do you mean for a couple of weeks? You said uh, you're in charge of the water uh, for a couple of days, actually. Of days. Um, um, Madam, Mr. Chair, um, Council Members, uh, this is my last environmental uh, committee meeting. Uh, my last day with the Met Council is going to be this Friday. I am moving back to California, and I accepted a job in Santa Clarita Valley Water Agency as the Director of Water Resources. So wow. I really appreciated the 10 years that I worked with many of you, I think, Council Member Wolf, that I have worked with you the longest in this uh, capacity. So I really appreciate all the great work that you have been doing for the Met Council and for the region. Thank you very much. We're going to miss you. Yeah, Thank you. congratulations. Thank you. It's good that California doesn't have any water issues <laughs> at all. It's just going to be a piece Mr. Of Chair, that's job why they're you. bringing me back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Lisa, did you wish to make a comment? Yeah, actually. Uh, Councilmember Wolf uh, stole the thunder. I wanted to be sure and thank Ollie and John for this partnership because certainly we're not going to achieve our vision of clean water for future generations without partnerships like this. But Ollie's been here for 10 years creating partnerships and collaborations and a great team to carry on while he goes to warmer climates before the snow hits. But we, we really are grateful for, for all that Ollie's done in his leadership role. And, as I've expressed to him already, we're gonna miss him and wish him the best in his next chapter. Thank you very much, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, appreciate it. And uh, well, we need to take a vote on this. Gosh, I got all wrapped up. <laughs> we need a motion first. We need a motion first. Second. Yeah, exactly, a motion has been made uh -huh. and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Passes unanimously. All right, and that takes us to our information items. Uh, first one up is uh, EPA annual DBE report. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Council Members, Ashanti Payne, uh, the Assistant Director in the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity and I am pleased this afternoon to present our federal fiscal year 2022 Environmental Protection Agency report for DBE summary for environmental services. I think it is important to point out that uh, this report is specific to our capital projects and programs uh, that uh, result from environmental services and is not linked at all to our uh, FTA DBE report 
um, and programs. The, the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity is responsible for, por, uh, for reporting annual DBE utilization for the Public Facilities Authority in October of each calendar year, and the Public Facilities Authority then forwards the report to the Environmental Protection Agency. In 2019, the EPA did do away with fair share goals, uh, where they require us to separate uh, women business enterprise participation from minority business enterprise uh, participation. However, uh, the Office of Equity and Equal Opportunity still breaks it down um, because we think it's important to better understand the data and for council members and the public to understand the data as well. Our disadvantaged business enterprise is specific to federal funds and uh, it's based our achievement is measured against our annual goal that is set triennially, um, and we are currently in the triennial period of 2021 through 2023, and our annual goal is 11%. Um, we achieve uh, results by setting specific project goals um, that are assigned a small business or DBE uh, goal by our small business unit staff. Um, I'm pleased to announce that we did achieve 16.7% uh, utilization in this reporting period on environmental service projects. Um, and how that breaks down, 6.18% uh, uh, went to minority business enterprises and 10.52% went to women business enterprises. DBE payments in 2022 were nearly 1.1 million more than in 2021, even though the uh, total disbursement from the Public Facilities Administration was, in 2022 was $14.34 million less than in 2021. Um, also, utilization from uh, Overall utilization for DBEs or MBE firms uh, was 57% 50, higher than in 2021. Um, and this next slide, you can see the breakdown between um, both by gender and ethnicity. Um, we have a much more uh, balanced uh, distribution in terms of equity uh, this, this year. Um, one of the things that I think is important to point out as well um, in 2021, minority-owned construction firm spend was roughly 830,000. However, in 2022, minority-owned firms' uh, construction increased to 1.8 million. In comparison, uh, women business enterprise construction spend uh, virtually stayed the same, uh, which is important, I think, because uh, conventional thought has it that if you increased uh, spend in, in opportunities with minority-owned businesses that women-owned business spend would go down. Um, so, and that did not happen. So that is also a positive uh, result of this uh, reporting period. Um, also, um, in the past, and when we've presented this data, I know that it was important for uh, council members to see um, how what, what our directory makeup is in terms of uh, uh, distribution, both from uh, uh, race and, and gender perspective. So we provided this just to kind of give perspective in terms of both our achievement and what businesses are certified in our disadvantaged business enterprise directory. In terms of some of the highlights that we've seen, um, a lot of our uh, participation in the increases in, in our uh, spend with DBE firms uh, was really 34% um, uh, higher in 2022. Um, and roughly 134,000 of the spend went to a MBE firm, USA Freak, which is a black owned business that participated in our mentor protege uh, program. Um, it's important to point out that this business did not have any business with the council prior to 2020 um, and has uh, 
uh, up over, done over a million dollars worth of business uh, with the council uh, since 2020. I'm sorry if you mentioned this. What, what is, what type of business do they provide? Um, Mr. Chair, Council Members, I will have, I'm, I'm not um, no 100%. Worries, no worries. I will get Just that curious. information. Yes. Um, but that also, um, also leads to some of the challenges that we still face. Um, one of the things that we have uh, noted is that a lot of this spend with the disadvantaged business enterprise uh, firms is with a select or, or relatively small group of businesses. Uh, so that is our next challenge in terms of, of, of what we would like to see and, and what we will be working on is to really increase the pool of disadvantaged business enterprise firms um, in terms of the diversity and in, in the services that they provide um, and the number uh, increase. So that is uh, our next challenge uh, that, that is on our jackets. I think the, the other um, uh, things that we wanted to note in terms of our process improvement relative to why we think we uh, seen an increase in our spend with uh, DBE businesses is really um, attributed to some of the, the targeted outreach and process improvement uh, initiatives that we have uh, been underway with, um, and also in an increased uh, proactive approach from the business unit themselves. Um, I always say, um, uh, probably a lot, uh, but my, my boss tells me to keep saying it, uh, the best ideas always come from the business unit. And it also allows us to be in a role that we're familiar with in terms of providing that support and technical expertise to make that idea uh, come to fruition. Um, so meet and greets, I mentioned the mentor-protege uh, programs where we uh, partner smaller firms with larger, longer established firms to work on specific parts of their business um, and to uh, uh, position those businesses to better compete for opportunities with the council. Um, we also have a new DBE orientation event planned for November where we're partnering with our other uh, uh, Partners in the in the region, uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation, uh, City of Minneapolis, uh, Metropolitan Airports Commission, um, uh, Department of Administration, uh, to do an orientation with newly certified DBEs to introduce them, make sure that they're aware of opportunities uh, with the council, how they can access those opportunities and participate in our programs and activities. With that, I will stand for any questions that the committee has for me. Any questions for Mr. Payne? Councilmember Sterner. Hey, thank you. Um, I was just wondering, like with the program, the orientation event, is there a way to try to encourage more people to be certified in that, to go ahead of the one, because we're working with newly certified businesses, but sometimes I think a lot of our business of color don't really even know there's a certification process. Is there a way to identify those and kind of work before the pipeline kind of thing to try to, you know, encourage that ahead of time. Mr. Chair, council members, uh, this particular event uh, does not have that focus, but yes, that is a focus um, and uh, being supported by our relatively new uh, uh, unit within the Office of Equity and Co-Opportunity, our Engagement and Development Unit. Um, that is something that we are actively uh, not only um, doing, but also measuring. Um, in terms of what our directory looks like, um, where the growth is, where the opportunities are, and to target um, businesses who either are not certified, are not aware of the certification, um, and also to direct them to resources um, because sometimes the certification process can be burdensome uh, to businesses. Um, so there are resources out there that help with that process as well. All right, thank you. Good question. Other, other questions? Clearly uh, more work to be done. I'm certainly glad we're meeting our goal. And um, this is, uh, this is a, a good report, so appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council members. Our next information item is the East Bethel 
Reclaimed Water Performance Update. Welcome to the committee. Good afternoon, Welcome. Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Members. We are here this afternoon to present information on the performance of the East Bethel Water Reclamation Facility. This presentation was requested by Council to provide an update on the region-wide benefits of this demonstration project. I'm here this afternoon with Jason Peterson and Dan Henley, and we will follow the agenda as before you. We'll be going through the background. I'll be presenting the background of the facility. Jason will take the next step of treatment performance. Dan will then follow up with a discussion of the groundwater monitoring, and I will then present some conclusions, and then we will entertain your questions. Again, my name is Carla Carls. I'm the Assistant Business Unit Manager in charge of the East Bethel and Rogers facilities. Um, it's hard to see that from here. But mm -hmm. The East Bethel Water Reclamation Facility collects water from the city of East Bethel, both residential, industrial, and business. It conveys it to our facility and where it is treated with membrane, filtration systems, and then finally UV disinfection before it travels through pipes to a subsurface land application basin. In the future, we are very hopeful that we will find some reuse partners and we will no longer be discharging to the infiltration basins, but we'll be partnering with other community members to reuse that water. The water then flow, after it is discharged, the land application basin that flows to the aquifer and then to Crooked Brook. There are no supply wells located within the in zone of influence of our land application basins. The next slide here is just kind of a pictorial a view of the treatment facility in the center, the long three to five mile long distribution line that takes it to our land application basins and then a very pretty picture of our actual Site E land application basin. That basin is covered with a natural prairie, and, um, but the, below that natural prairie is the land application basin itself. The discharge from this facility is governed by an SDS permit issued by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. The initial um, permit for this facility was um, granted in 2010 and it was granted at the highest treatment level possible in the state, the tertiary level. For the first few years of operation, it became obvious that we were not going to have a partnership readily available and that this facility was now being regulated at a very strict and high tertiary level. We began, staff with MCS began conversations with MPCA along with the city of Mankato to look at the guidelines established by MC, MPCA for reuse of wastewater in the state. Through those conversations with the city of Mankato, MCES, and MPCA, in 2010, we were issued a new permit with three tiers. The tiers are representative of the level of treatment. The disinfectant dis infected secondary treatment, that's easy for me to say, mm -hmm. <laughs> at 200 MPN is the lowest level of treatment. That discharge would be suitable for irrigation and of course subsurface injection like we are doing now. The second level of treatment, disinfected secondary 23 MPN, total coliform, would be usable for cooling water, non-contact water through industrial partners. And the highest level, the tertiary level, would be suitable for toilet flushing, irrigation at um, golf courses, and direct contact with the public. Although we are currently being regulated at the disinfected 200 most probable number, we are operating our facility at the tertiary level so that we can, through this demonstration project, show the benefit to the region of that level of treatment. At that point, Jason will tell you more about our success in that treatment performance. Thank you, Carl. Mr. Chair, committee members, I'm Jason Peterson. I'm an engineer with plant engineering that oversees the East Bethel plant. And 
Um, as part of the demonstration project, MCS wanted to show that the East Bethel water reclamation facility could achieve that most stringent disinfected tertiary level. It's the hardest of the three permit levels to achieve. And MCS had many new things to learn about this new process and a more and a higher effluent quality than we've ever had before. And one of those things was the disinfection system. And as we pushed it to its limits, we learned that we really had to tie in the plant wastewater characteristics with the type of disinfection we used. And at first, when we got that new permit, we had a very high pressure, high temperature disinfection system that would bake the iron out of the water onto the bulbs and create a film, <laughs> eliminating its ability to transmit light and disinfect. So our first mechanical upgrade as part of the demonstration, and our really only large mechanical upgrade, was to switch out the style of disinfection to one that is aligned with high iron content water. So these bulbs are at a lower pressure and lower temperature, so it cut down on the amount of time we had to spend cleaning that film off the bulbs, and it has created a very trustworthy and consistent um, disinfection system in East Bethel. And that's made a big difference for us. The part of that permit, I guess this is the first one. Oh, yeah. Part of the permit, the highest level, is the total coliform. And there are two components of that. The first one is the 240 daily maximum. And we had one instance where it went over that 240. I think that was back in 2019. And, but since we have upgraded the disinfection system, the highest number we've ever achieved is 19 MPN. And that was in... Yeah, back in 2019. So, and the other component of the total coliform, this is a very exciting graph, I know, but <laughs> what it explains is actually quite exciting in that the second component of the coliform is the seven day moving median. And that this bottom line is at the base for the whole life of the water reclamation facility shows that any time there was a coliform incident in or presence in the plant that Mechanically and through the work of the operations staff, we were able to bring it back to the lowest level in one or two days. So we've never had something bounce off that lowest line for the life of the plant through the whole demonstration project. And finally, the last unique component of the permit was the turbidity. And there's, these numbers go around a lot, and our limit was 10. And we have hit that handful of times there, but we have never gone over 10, which is the exciting part of this graph. So. That shows our performance, and I'm going to hand it off to Dan. All right, thank you, Jason. Uh, Mr. Chair, committee members, uh, my name is Daniel Henley. I'm assistant manager of our water resources group. Thank you, Jason. And today I'll be talking about our groundwater data and how that has been measuring um, the performance and looking to ensure we're not having negative impacts on that superficial aquifer. So we've mentioned the land application, uh, for also known as lab, uh, and lab E there on the left-hand side is the primary basin, and that's where we'll be sharing some of our data. Kind of the highlight here for groundwater is we've got a, a, a network of wells on the north, south, east, and west, um, and that's where the data will be coming from. The well on the east side, on the right-hand side of lab E, is where we had seen some of that higher nitrate concentrations, and so I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that, but as far as if you're a map person um, on that right-hand side. So we have um, some higher levels of concentration in that uh, east well uh, at 11, and this is the average of that, and so this is something that we, we saw in the early data, and I'll be touching a little bit on that later, but the uh, other wells in the labs are ranging from that one to five milligrams per liter, and so um, they're, they're much lower as opposed to the east and south well that we're kind of highlighting there. Um, for some context here, the PCA did a study on kind of what to expect in nitrate levels in an aquifer, and so they actually did it on the Noka sand plain, which is where this is located, and so we've got kind of a range from a 6 milligrams per liter in a non-sewer residential area to a 15 if you're just purely agriculture. And so this is a mixed area, so we're kind of expecting somewhere in that range, which we are falling. Um, the <clears throat> the note here with the 11, which is, you know, f relatively high, is that that's an average of all the data. So we've been collecting data since 2014 up to, to now, and so that's an average overall. But when we're trying to evaluate impacts that we may be having on that aquifer, it's, it's more difficult. But we want to take a look as things change over time. And so 
take a second to explain the colors here. So the black line that's been steadily increasing is our plant flow volume. So we've been steadily increasing the, the amount we've been discharging. The blue, orange, gray, and yellow are those wells and their concentrations of nitrate. And so kind of earlier in our monitoring period, you can see some of the higher wells. That's the blue and the orange, the blue being that east well that we saw at 11. And what's, what's interesting about this is that as we've seen plant flows increase, we've actually seen groundwater concentrations decrease over that same amount of time. So, so this is a positive sign for you know, the, the success of, you know, measure of our success of treating this water and, and not having any impacts on the aquifer. Uh, and interesting, you know, in the past, you know, year, which has been drier years, there's, we're actually around six. You can see the, the last few blue lines or blue dots there are hanging around six, which is that low end of that PCA study range, the spectrum that they expected. So in a, for a non-sewered residential area, they'd expect six, and that's exactly what that well is. And the other wells are, are much below that. Um, kind of another contextual reference here, our effluent as we are discharging it into these basins is around five or less generally consistently. So that's the concentration of the water that's, that we're applying and then we're seeing um, relatively at that or less than that this past year. And, and like I said, it's drier, so I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. But so that inverse relationship is important because we see increasing plant flows, decreasing concentrations, and, and that's really a positive sign for, for us and protecting that, that aquifer. And as we move forward in time, you know, we are gonna continue to monitor this, you know, live our MCS mission of uh, protecting our region's waters, so we'll be continuing to monitor it and assess it if there's any impacts, maybe additional studies, especially as our plant flows continue, they're steadily increasing, you know, that, that black line might continue to keep going up. So we'll, we'll be keeping an eye on it. If uh, we could interrupt for just a second, uh, Councilmember Zirin has a, a question. Chair, sure. uh, I'm just wondering what other uh, contributing factors uh, in the area that we know about that would be uh, adding more nitrates uh, to the groundwater? Mr. Chair, committee members, great question. Uh, you know, the the drier conditions, I think, could, you know, point towards, or, you know, I think there's some follow-up there in terms of, like, why, when it was maybe wetter, were there higher concentrations? You know, there's certainly non-point nitrate sources that can infiltrate just as much as anything. So um, at fertilizer applications, it is a mixed area, so maybe there's some runoff from, from increased rainfall um, during those wetter years, and maybe we're not seeing that in drier years. And so usually in a drier year, the inputs are, are limited and, and we would expect maybe to see more of an impact from our discharge because we're constantly doing that. Mm -hmm. And we obviously saw the inverse of that. We actually saw them drop back down to a normal level. It's also a non-sewered area, so septic systems may have an impact. You know, if we see a spike or something, there might be a, a malfunctioning septic system in the area that we could look into. But that's some dynamics that we could evaluate in the future. A follow-up? Well, yeah, well, you just said non-sewered area, but this is a treatment plant, right? So we're trying to get people to connect? I'll pass that on. Sure. <laughs> yes, this, the plant was built on the west side of 65, and in the initial plans, we just sewered areas on the west side, and as development takes place, the city is expanding sewer service farther and farther east. So it will be sewered, I don't know, Thank you. eight to 10 years from now. It's been a long, a long time coming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so thank you for your questions, Mr. Chair and committee members. In conclusion, I'd just like to hit the highlight reel of all we've accomplished <laughs> over the last few years. We have successfully demonstrated that we can gain and negotiate favorable permits for reuse in this region. We have successfully demonstrated without exception since September of 2019 that we can meet that tertiary level of treatment that we talked about. We also have successfully demonstrated, it's hard for me to read from here, <laughs> successfully demonstrated um, that we are not impacting the subsurface water quality. In fact, we might even be improving it a little bit. We will continue to monitor that as the flow at the wastewater facility continues to increase and keep you informed. So thank you for your attention 
and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have, although some of you have asked some. So if anyone else has anything, we'd be happy to ask, answer them. Wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, any other questions? Can I give a comment? Of course. <laughs> the, this plant has probably been uh, the most, uh, in my tenure as a, as a council member, the, I don't know why it's controversial. I really don't. Uh, but uh, it's created the most uh, interactions uh, with the, with the public is around this plant, and uh, and, I, and I don't know why it's controversial. I really don't. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, an asset to the area. It'll help growth uh, and keep the water clean. Um, but there's a, a lot of conversation that goes along with that. And I think there's some misnomers out there about the plant and what's going on there. Uh, one, one question that keeps coming up is, uh, is about trucking from that plant. I don't know why that's a question, uh, why that there are people so interested in that, but could you uh, uh, give us any information on the amount of solids that we truck from the plant and, and uh, uh, I'll let you take it from here. Mr. Chair, committee members, we are currently trucking about three truck loads of solid, or semi-solid liquid out of the facility a week, up to four perhaps. We do, um, we are located right next to a trucking company that has <laughs> semis that go in and out um, mm -hmm. early in the morning when I'm getting there they're already on the road and coming back after I left so it's kind of an industrial area with a lot of truck traffic in general um, some construction companies very close just literally corner to corner from us as construction companies so there is a lot of truck traffic but we are contributing roughly four trucks a week to that truck traffic if you don't mind. Yeah, that's or, interesting. People uh, may not be, it, it, be, people may be confused about where these trucks are coming from. Or or even why it needs to be, uh, and, and those trucks are then going to another plant or another. So they're construction trucks, they're hauling gravel, some of them are miscellaneous construction material. They don't look exactly like a tanker truck, like our truck looks. Our truck is actually a smaller truck than what the other residents of the industrial park are using. Plus, I don't know if you're aware, but Country Hearth has just located a marketing center or a retail, not retail, but uh, housing for some trucks, service trucks, very close to the facility as well. So that did also increase that truck traffic. My, my question is, uh, of the biosolids that we're, we're hauling out, where are they going? They're going to the Fridley lift station currently. Okay. Thank you. I think uh, this presentation showed that this type of facility can be a great success. Um, we do a wonderful job taking in wastewater and then usually passing it down to the Atlantic Ocean eventually in a month or so when it gets to the Gulf of Mexico. Um, but here we are proving that we can use it for other other sources in a, in a safe and successful way. And it's really interesting. I love that picture of um, the Lab E effluent infiltration site. I mean, if you just saw that picture and asked people, what are you looking at? You would get answers of, uh, you're looking at a prairie, you're looking at a place for habitat, for birds, for butterflies, for little critters. Um, not really knowing that we are recharging um, the groundwater, um, which we've heard from Mr. El Hassan for three years, how important that is, right? Um, so kudos to you and uh, Councilmember Wolf has a question. Thank you. Hopefully this will help people get over the ick factor. You know, yes. just people get the heebie-jeebies and. Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux community uses a similar process where they irrigate the golf course and their grass around the tribal areas and whatnot too. So it, it happens where people are and they don't realize it if nobody tells them, but it, hopefully this is good news for the people who are worried about 
what's coming out of there, that it is clean water that will have no harm on the environment and hopefully help it to some degree. Absolutely. Any other questions or comments? Thank you very much. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And that takes us to the general manager's report. Lisa, any, any updates? No updates other than to give applause to this facility as a demonstration. Um, the unpopularity probably stems from it was forecasted to have a lot more population growth than it did. And we did have some challenges figuring out how the SAC rates would be and, and some of the financing piece. So it's affecting their development. But in the end, I think we're all, all of the region is going to benefit from being able to demonstrate and work with resolving the challenges that come with trying to treat to this level and find a different way to discharge other than putting in the river and sending it to the Gulf. And we know we need to do less of that over time. So. Lots of good work being done by staff to figure out better ways of achieving clean water for future generations. Well, if there's nothing else, thank you very much. Oh, yes. Council Member Vento. I do have one question, Mr. Chair of the Manager. Um, uh, COVID rates and, and um, the assessment of that. Um, any more as far as with the talk now of the um, RSV and the flu of a triple threat. Is there any more conversation about Steve continuing his great work? We're working with a in partnership with the Department of Health to okay. keep on t to keep tabs on if there was additional testing that would be valuable to to do. We're standing ready to to do that work, but at this point, we're just focusing on the COVID. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. We are adjourned. Have a great evening.